Um, the question about credibility uh, is a critical one. But before I answer that, let me uh, kick off by first offering a couple of uh, quick comments uh, on the excellent study that has uh, been produced by, uh, by General Perruche. Um, it must be stated at the outset that this constitutes uh, at present the most up-to-date and comprehensive review of where the European Union stands today in terms of preparing for uh, operational uh, crisis management. Um, and I very much applaud the, the broad thrust um, of, of the argument uh, in the sense that it starts with a clear diagnosis of the, of the problem. It offers a clear set of, of recommendations, and there are two that I would uh, like to highlight in, in particular, namely the idea that professionalism requires permanence, and that has all sorts of implications for command and control arrangements um, and, and the OHQ question. And then on the other hand, um, the, the call for um, the drafting of a, a joint force concept, um, which would constitute by itself an important signal regarding the qualitative level of ambition that the European <coughs> Union uh, may aspire to in the, uh, in the realm of defense. Um, but the general also offers a very frank um, conclusion, namely that operational measures cannot make up for a lack of um, political will. Um, and that sort of sets the scene for the, uh, um, the review of where we stand in terms of credibility, because that, that analysis, which is indisputably correct uh, in my view, has been known for quite a long time, um, in the sense that um, CF, uh, CSDP um, became operational from 2003 onwards. And after a few operations, these lessons were pretty clear. And we are now roughly a decade uh, later in time, and we're still like, yeah, we need uh, a permanent uh, command and, and, and control chain, and we, um, uh, we are still not, not there. Um, so I think something else is going on, and um, the issue to, that I want to draw your attention to is that over the past uh, 10 years, uh, I increasingly believe that um, <coughs> the notion of European defense cooperation has sort of been um, misused as a political device for what I call the cloaking uh, or masking of the, the hollowing out of, of national defense uh, establishments, which has um, continued uh, uh, relentlessly uh, for approximately three, three decades now. Um, and when the European Council I mean, started having a, uh, a frank debate uh, on, on defense in 2013, some colleagues of mine, uh, and I authored a publication titled The State of Defense in Europe, A State of Emergency. Um, and by and large, that is now slowly being recognized, but the sad reality is that in some ways it is already too late to fix the problem in the sense that there is a, a long time delay between defense investment on the one hand uh, and operational output um, on the other hand. And in between where we were in 2013 and now, the actual defense debate in terms of substance, it has um, moved quite a long way uh, in terms of policy substance. There has been like a massive comeback of, of hard defense questions, uh, debates about deterrence, including nuclear deterrence, uh, et, et cetera. And that has the consequence that even if we were now to implement all the recommendations that were already recognized in the CSDP community 10 years ago, the OHQ uh, reviewing the Athena mechanism, et cetera, Imagine that all, all that is realized tomorrow. The, the issue is that those measures of progress would become quite insignificant because of the fact that the challenges in the meantime have grown so much larger. Uh, take the battle groups as an example. Um, imagine a hypothetical scenario in which um, a foreign power would suddenly grab Gotland Island um, in the Baltic Sea. W would sending a battle group be an obvious response? 
it would be kind of problematic. The situation in Syria today, separation of warring parties by force, send in a battle group. A battle group, that's like taking an airport and patrolling the surroundings. There is a battle group on the streets of Brussels today, just as a top-up of the, of the city police, to be clear. Um, so I think we're gradually waking up to the reality that we have neglected defense for quite a long time, and this is coming to haunt us in the sense that security threats, after going further away, geographically speaking, for 20, 30 years, they're now coming closer home, and they're becoming bigger uh, in, in size. And the real issue is that we uh, more and more realize we lack the toolkit uh, to deal with them in a um, uh, sort of adequate uh, fashion. And there's then the, the conceptual debate over how to arrange this uh, EU NATO, et cetera. I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. So I think the capabilities question is really the heart of the matter um, of the European defense debate today. And the capabilities debate in the European Union, it's, it's known above all for we need air-to-air -air refueling uh, capabilities, we need UAVs, etc. That were the capability shortfalls that resulted from the crisis management operations of the pre-2014 era. Um, nowadays, the capability requirements um, in a broader framework, taking uh, national perspectives, NATO and, and the European Union, together into account, the, the capability requirements, they're going upwards quite, um, quite rapidly, uh, both qualitatively and even in a, in a quantitative sense. Um, and the explanation for that is, is pretty self-evident. For the past 25 years or so, uh, defense planners were proceeding on the assumption that, well, Russia was a, was a partner not to be uh, analyzed as a potential threat. And while I certainly hope and believe that a conflict with Russia um, may be uh, avoided, uh, from a defense planner's perspective, uh, it, it's simply irresponsible to ignore the very possibility. And that just upsets the whole calculation of what sort of capabilities one actually needs for defending the, the European continent. So there is now this debate emerging over what would be the appropriate military level um, of ambition uh, that could guide uh, European capability if we want to take this uh, seriously. Um, my view is that one cannot look at a level of ambition through a narrow CSDP lens, because then you can never aspire to really um, uh, synchronize what's going on at, at the national level. So you need to look at the, the broad picture because we're talking about constructing the pool of forces of all European uh, Union member states um, combined. Um, and in, in a recent paper I argued, I uh, um, put forward a case for what I called the, the three plus one force planning construct, namely the ability to um, uh, conduct a handful of um, smaller brigade-level uh, operations in all domains, plus one large uh, troop-intensive uh, operation, so that you get the idea that um, the European level of ambition, it's sort of half uh, meeting the, uh, the transatlantic level of ambition halfway, but to re reverse the priorities in a conceptual sense, that it's um, um, uh, talking uh, not so much uh, about high intensity conflict first, uh, but about uh, the operations that uh, um, uh, we are actually doing and, and build on, on, on that. So such a force planning construct, it would um, allow for conceptualizing uh, um, a combined force pool that is both deep in terms of numbers uh, and balanced. Um, uh, across all domains, but also balance between enablers and raw firepower, uh, because that's something that also needs to be said uh, quite explicitly. Um, the European firepower for really blowing up things, 
that is a very short demand uh, in a historical sense, and if you're talking about, uh, uh, about high-intensity operations in particular. So if you would really want to see a, a big push for European defense, I, I like to say, well, how about we all like put a, uh, um, a sizable volume of, uh, of money together and task the guys at Airbus to develop a strategic bomber because that's something that no single European country has uh, and that no single country could actually aspire to. But if we really talk about strategic autonomy, that's the sort of stuff that, that, one, really, that one really needs. Um, one final remark um, about the, uh, the institutional um, division of labor between the European Union and, and, and NATO. I think it makes most sense to look at this as a sort of um, a head and shoulder pattern uh, for those of you who are familiar with, with financial analysis. So that you have a left and a right shoulder that is fully European um, and um, uh, a, a transatlantic head to it. Let me explain that. I think the left shoulder is, well, European defense cooperation, it starts with the industrial dimension, um, with investing in R&D, etc. That's all stuff in which the Commission has certain competences, for which the European Defence Agency has, has been tasked, and there's no doubt about it that there's like a very prominent and even central European dimension to this. The right, ha the right shoulder uh, of the construct, you could conceptualize as well, there is already a need for um, certain autonomous operations in the European neighbourhood, in which um, our American friends are simply not interested uh, or keen to be involved, in which they would actually like the Europeans to just do their thing completely by, by themselves. Um, the sort of thing that we saw unfold in, uh, in Mali and the Sahel would be a, an excellent example uh, of that. There's also the whole debate about hybrid um, uh, warfare competition in which non-military means play a very prominent uh, role. There's the debate about European solidarity under Article 42.7, um, involving in particularly um, uh, countries uh, like Sweden and, uh, and, and, and Finland. That are all debates in which, again, the European dimension is central. And then, of course, in the middle, you have the peak, um, where NATO, up to the present day, remains the primary framework for the really high-end stuff. And then we're talking nuclear deterrence, collective defense, kinetic operations of the highest intensity. Does the European Union want to do that at present? I think having a debate about um, a European deterrent is perhaps not something that everyone would, uh, would subscribe to. But if there is any doubt, um, over whether um, the uh, Americans will always be with us, well, the safe assumption is, well, if you have a construct like that, if ever Europeans end up in a situation where they're on their own and have to fend for their own, they can regrow the capabilities that they need very quickly, and that's actually uh, uh, a critical component of any meaningful level of ambition. Thank you.